Okay, last week we were talking about the servant. That's how we began our notes with talking about the servant. And we started with the servant spirituality. And we talked about a couple of things underneath that, the qualifications of a servant and the qualities of a servant. That's a spirit, servant's spirituality. Now we want to look at capital letter B, the servant's focus. The servant's focus. Now this is not a trick question, but what do you think, uh, what should be the main focus of a servant? It's not tricky. Jacob? To serve. To serve, yes. That's good. You might get one on the, right on the quiz next week. <laughs> the, the main focus of a servant is to serve. So let's consider th three people or three groups of people that we should serve. Number one, serve the Lord. Now, that should go without saying, but we got to remember that all of our service is primarily, first and foremost, to God. You're going to get very discouraged in life if you're just living um, and looking for a pat on the back from the pastor. Okay, You're not always going to get that. Or li living for the pat on the back, the attaboy, as we say, uh, from the ministry leader. You know, I did such a good job in that story, and my bus captain didn't even say anything. He said, okay, all right, kids, next thing we're going to do, and you're saying, I, I just poured my heart into this. And he's just going to, or, no, well, we'll get to that later. I had another thing I was going to tell you. Um, so here you are, you, 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 you've got this visual of the year, and you've just, you're going to wow the kids with this visual of the year, and then... No one says anything. Like, great visual. Wow, stunning, immaculate, impressive, captivating people's attention. And they said, okay, next. So, okay. Or you know, then you come back the next week with another one. Oh, it wasn't as good as last week's. It's like, come on, you know, I'm doing my best. But if you're just living for the approval of man, you're going to get discouraged. And we should never live for the praise of man. And unfortunately, in our circles, a lot of people do live for the praise of man. It's always trying to, you know, get the attention of, of the leadership. Oh, I want to impress them. I want to be like so-and-so. I want to be a big name. There, no, there should be no big names in the church, right? Should be just a bunch of servants. And the people at the top should be servants. That's what we should be. In Colossians 3, 23, the Bible says, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. If we would have that attitude, then our service will be a lot better, won't it? Because we're not worried about how people take it, you know, how, how, if people like what we've done or not. All we are concerned about is if we're pleasing God. If you please God, you're doing all right. So the first one, as we talked about, number one, we need to serve the Lord. I'll give you a couple thoughts about this, two thoughts on how we can serve the Lord or how we should serve the Lord. First of, first of all would be letter A, with diligence. With diligence. Romans 12, 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Not slothful in business. Don't be lazy. Okay? Fervent in spirit. Just keeping at it. We need to give them our best. Really. And so when you tell a story, you do your best. You're not doing it for the kids. In a sense you are. I understand that. You're trying to reach them. You're trying to help, help them. But you're not trying to entertain them. You're trying to do it for God. When you teach a verse, it's not to fill in time. Well, it's part of the program. Let's just get that done and out of the way so we can get on to other things. No, you're, you're doing your best. It is God's Word. It is the Word of God. And if you believe the Word of God changes life, then you're going to be excited about the verse. You're going to, and, and hopefully, you know, I know when I was making up bus schedules, junior church schedules and things like that, I'd pray and ask God's wisdom and even choosing the right verses, choosing the right stories, choosing the right you know, themes to preach on or whatever it would be. And so we're trying to get God's word out. Even if it's just, you say, it's just the verse. No, it is God's word, not just a verse. 
And your lack of excitement, your lack of doing your best, your, your um, not making a, a good visual or something like that might just show eh, it's no big deal to the kids. But it is a big deal. And we need to give them our best when we play, play a game. Everything you do, do it for him. So do it with diligence and then letter B would be with determination. With determination. Things will get difficult. Okay. Now this is across the board in your ministries now. And if you go on into full-time Christian service, it's going to get more difficult. It doesn't get easier. It gets more difficult. The problems get bigger. If you think the problems are big now and you're just a worker or just to help, you say, I'm just a worker? Well, yeah, I'm, you're not carrying the load. Okay? Carry the load of the entire bus route when you're a bus captain. It changes. Anyone I've ever talked to who's gone from a bus worker to running a bus, all of a sudden it's, it's a huge, big responsibility. You feel the weight. Now you take that and go into leading a church. It is a huge weight of responsibility, and you're going you're gonna to feel it. And things are going to get tough, but you have to be just determined you're going to keep going. You're not going to quit. You're going to serve the Lord. Acts 20 Verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. And listen to what Paul said. And with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Many tears. That doesn't sound exciting, does it? The ministry is very rewarding. It's very fulfilling. It's very challenging. It's very heartbreaking. And sometimes you have to go through a lot of difficult times. There'll be... There'll be people who lie about you. And all you're trying to do is help people. And they're lying about you. They're sowing discord among the brethren. They're, they're trying to keep people from coming to church. Okay, they lie about you. You know, I don't know how many times in, in Zambia I was called a Satanist. I look like one, don't I? You know, here I am. I'm going around carrying a Bible passing out gospel tracts, telling people about Jesus, inviting them to church. And people say, oh, don't go there. He's a Satanist. I, I just, I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. Well, it does make sense because the devil always has his group of people trying to keep others from hearing the word of God and finding the truth and finding salvation. Now, maybe some of the other things they said about me was true, right? <laughs> but... But they do lie about you. They'll falsely accuse you. You'll be misunderstood. Uh, they, they will... They, <laughs> I remember one time, uh, I was, I was, uh, when I took a church in Nebraska, a, a lady, I mean, she, she came up to me right before the church service started, you know. Don't, don't ever dump anything on a pastor or a preacher right before he gets up to preach, okay? If you have a problem, tell them about it after the preaching, all right? And it, she just came and basically says, you know, you're too loud and you're too long and, you know, I don't, I don't appreciate what you're saying. <laughs> There's some old lady in the church. And she wasn't even a member, but she, it, that was real encouraging right before I got up to preach. Okay. Uh, some people hate you, but you still need to serve the Lord. And it's not just for the future. You'll have misunderstandings and problems even now. I was talking to someone who's in the ministry now. And I was, I was with him this, this summer. He used to work as one of my bus workers. This was many, many years ago. He was one of my bus workers. And he reminded me of the story. I had completely forgotten about it. He said, do you remember when so-and-so accused me of cursing, cussing? I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. I said, you didn't get in trouble for that. He says, no, no. But what, you know, I, didn't, but what I did do let me say this. Okay, he's a college student. He comes here. Do I know everything about him? Do I know his background? And here's a faithful bus kid who's been coming for a long time. Could the faithful bus kid be telling the truth? Maybe. And that'd be a pretty serious problem if I've got a college student bus worker supposedly training for the ministry cussing. <laughs> We've got a problem here, you know? And I really wouldn't want them on my bus route, would you? No. So what do you do? 
You don't know what to do? I don't know what to do either. I was like, oh, okay. So I just remember sitting down talking to him. I said, hey, um, so and so, did you say this? You know, I tried, I tried to work it out and, and work with him on it. And I, I confronted him. He said no. And one thing I learned a long, 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 long time ago when I was a principal, that was many, many moons ago, was this, that if someone's guilty of something and you don't have the goods on them, you don't have to do anything because they're probably going to do it again. And when they do it again, you got the goods and you got them. Amen? And so what I did was I just kept my <coughs> eyes open. Okay? And I was more careful where, where he went, what he did. And, but what I'm trying to say is he brought it up. Why did he remember that? Because it hurt him. It hurt him. And he was understanding as a college student, what, he was getting a little taste of what the ministry is going to be like, being lied about, being misunderstood. Here you're just trying to do something for God. And it wasn't true, and thankfully it wasn't true. And I didn't, you know, punish him. I didn't kick him off the bus. I kicked him off the bus one Sunday for something else, but <laughs> we had some, some laughs about that one too. Uh, but, you know, the Lord it wants us to just to serve him. If you're doing what's right and everybody else misunderstands you, just keep serving the Lord. He'll take care of it. He will take care of it. In the ministry, I have been lied about. I have been maligned. I have been gossiped about. And it hurts. It hurts. But in every case, you know, I think of two huge cases, but in every case, God took care of it. It took a while. Sometimes it took some years, but God always took care of it. And so I, I've just learned you just got to serve the Lord. Don't worry about everybody else. Just serve the Lord. And this is, the, this is what we're trying to talk about today and last week. Just be a servant. You're not looking for a position. You're not looking for, you know, popularity. You're just looking to help people. And sometimes it'll be difficult. But you do it anyway, and God will bless you for it. So we're serving. The, the, the servant's focus is, first of all, to serve the Lord. Secondly, number two, is to serve the lost. We have a debt that we owe, but it is not only to the Lord. We owe a debt to the lost. You say, why do I owe them a debt? <coughs> well, because the Bible teaches that. And because we owe them a debt, we should serve them. In Romans 1, 14 and 15... <laughs> Scripture says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all. Here's the great Apostle Paul. Well, what made him the great Apostle Paul? He made himself a servant unto unto all. Did we read anything about that last week? Did we talk about that last week? Where, what did Jesus say? Who was going to be the greatest? The person who would be servant of all? And here we find Paul doing the very thing that Jesus instructed. And can we not also make ourselves servant unto all? We can. We can. And he, he did that. He says, I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. So the purpose that Paul served the lost was to win them. And of course, we're familiar with uh, 1 Corinthians 9.22, where he says, To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. I hope you're writing these references down so that you can look them up. If you just take notes to take notes to get done and through a course, you're going to miss the whole purpose of the course. We're trying to teach the Word of God. Now, let me say this, too. This is like a, a side note. A lot of times, I will, you know, I'll give a test or something like that, and someone will say, it's, it happens from time to time, someone will say, it wasn't in my notes. And I'll simply say, it was in mine. So because it's not in your notes doesn't mean it's not going to be on the test. <laughs> it's in mine. 
When I was a college student, I think my notes that I took were, I think I took more notes than what the teacher actually had in his outline. I wrote everything. I never stopped. I'm not saying you have to do that. I wrote everything that came out of the teacher's mouth because I wanted to have everything I could have. I wanted to leave that class full. I wanted to leave that class with a lot. And just because it's not in your notes doesn't mean it's not going to be in the test. What's in my notes is what counts. All right, so I just encourage you to. Oh, that's one time. I, 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 this, is, this is true story. One time I was teaching, and one of the students, you know, I, I gave the test back, and no, it wasn't in my notes. And I said, I was explaining something. I gave the point. I said, I was explaining it. And no, I am not kidding you. The student said, I thought you were just talking. <laughs> yes, I was just talking. I was just explaining the notes for you to have an understanding so you could learn something and be a better person out of it. But anyway, I was just talking. <laughs> so it's amazing as a teacher watching how some people, when they hear point number one, and then you go to point number two, and then it's all of a sudden they wake up and they write down point number two, or they type it, point number two, and then they go back to sleep. They turn you off for a little while, they get that glazed look over their eyes until they hear point number three, and it's, oh, yeah, it's point number three. Let's continue with point number three. <laughs> All right, so we are ser our servant's focus is to serve the Lord, serve the lost, and serve. Number three, serve. Any ideas? You could be right. You could be wrong. Each other? Yeah, it's close. How about my point? The brethren. Serve the brethren. Serve the brethren. Galatians 6, 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. One of the greatest ways we can serve is by helping the brethren. In Matthew chapter 25, verse number 40, Jesus was speaking. He said, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as I... As ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So Jesus was teaching that when we serve the brethren, we're really serving who? The Lord. Did you say four or four? Forty. Matthew 25, 40. Yeah, we've, we've really served him. So in your church ministries, you ought to always be looking for people to help. And that includes your fellow workers. Okay? Just because they're assigned to do something on the bus doesn't mean you can't jump up and help. Now, if they're assigned bus cleanup, let them do it, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> no I mean, it doesn't mean you, you, you'd have to say, well, I'm not assigned, so I'm not touching that broom. Okay, well, maybe you could help. All right, maybe it's an especially messy day. Ever have watermelon on the bus? The question would be, why did you have the watermelon on the bus? Why didn't you have it off the bus? Because it's like that perma stick on the, on the floor. And you're not going to get it off with just a casual mopping. It's really exciting. So if you see that your bus captain has down, you know, watermelon one day for the, just say, can we go to a park and eat that for, especially if you're on bus cleanup. Now, if someone you don't like is on bus cleanup, then you can certainly say, hey, let's just, eat it right here in the bus, have a good time. <laughs> all right, as a bus captain, uh, we're talking about serve the brethren, all right? So it's your job, it's my job, it's everyone's job to serve one another. You know, really, if, if everyone just followed the Bible, it works pretty good, doesn't it? Real, God's ways always work. And so if the, the leader of the ministry is a servant, He's going to help his people. If the, the people in the, in the ministry are servants, they're going to help each other. They're going to help the leader. And it's, it's just going to be one big happy family. But sometimes it's not one big happy family. <laughs> sometimes it's, the tensions are... Because <laughs> okay? all, we all have a flesh, and we all have to learn to love one another and forgive one another and pick up the pieces and move on. 
All right. Now Matt's over there smiling. Now I've got three of my family members on the same bus as he's on, so I don't know if he's sitting there thinking, <laughs> yeah, got to learn to forgive those people. I don't know. <laughs> but I'll go back. As a bus captain, my, minist my ministry was to lead the bus, yes, but my ministry was to serve the Lord, the lost, and the brethren. If I was going to do it right, I would not be just trying to please God. Of course, I'm going to try to do that and not just try to win the loss. But I'm also going to try to help my workers. I remember, you know, one time, uh, not, I, I taught our, ver our workers how to make a visual. I just had a bus meeting. Every once in a while, we'd have a separate bus meeting on Saturdays, and I'd teach them some things. I'd encourage them sometimes through the scriptures, sometimes I'd give them some practical help. Sometimes I'd get on them a little bit, but uh, some of the people, I mean, they were just showing up with these lame, sorry excuses for vi visuals. And I, I said, you know, I can make a visual, and I'm a guy. And I said, I'm going to teach these guys that you can, anybody can make a visual. So I, I, you know, I got the poster board, I got the opaque machine, I got some clip art, and I put it up there, and I'm showing how, I, and I was trying to, it's one thing to say, make a visual, and you can yell at people, and t and, but that's not going to go very far. Instead, I said, I said, well, let me just try to show them how to make a visual. I was trying to teach them, I was trying to serve them, and that's what we have to do as leaders not just bark orders and commands. And as a bus captain, one of my greatest goals was to train the college students who worked under me. Okay, I had a wonderful opportunity. You know, I was a staff member, yes. I was a bus captain, yes. But I had college students coming in. They were training for the ministry, and they were going to go out and serve God. A lot of what they were going to learn in the ministry for their future ministry was what they were going to learn out in their local church ministries. The lessons they learn on the bus route, so many have come back to say, you know, I needed that. I, I learned so much from how to, how to be a pastor, how much, so much from how to be a missionary from just working on the bus route. Learning to go out on Saturdays and, and interact with the people and, and running the programs and things like that on the bus on, on Sunday. And several of those people who worked on my my routes over the years um, became pastors and missionaries mission fields represented I'll give you a few here <coughs> Belarus Russia Ukraine Zambia Canada Peru Australia and the Philippines now did I make them great missionaries no all I'm trying to say is that I'm, I looked at it as that I had a part and I'm not even saying I had a great part but I tried to, as a, my, one of my personal goals is try to teach people how to um, be prepared for their ministries. And many of our, your ministry leaders want to help you prepare for the future also. Now, if you think, well, they're just getting on me. Well, I don't, many, I don't know many people who are in the ministry just to get on people. If they are, it's, it's pretty sorry. But there are times that we need to be gotten on because sometimes we are pretty sorry. Sometimes we are pretty lame. Sometimes we think that we're doing something when we're really not doing it, and we don't like someone else to point it out because we have pride. Mm, it's not a good thing. Which brings me into our next point. All right, so our, the servant's focus, that was capital letter B. And what was the servant's focus? To serve. Now, capital letter C. The servant's pitfalls. It's not going to be easy for a servant. There's always going to be problems and possibilities to trip up, and we're going to talk about some of those. One we've already kind of touched on on our first day of class, but we'll go into it a little bit more here. So the servant's pitfalls. Number one, pride. Pride. It's very easy to begin to think that you deserve more opportunities to do the big things in class or on the bus, the important things in the ministry. I want to do that. You know, people, they long to preach, and that's good. They long to tell the story. That's wonderful. 
And some people would actually, on the other side, would dread to have to be up there and telling the story. It's your jo job to tell the story this Sunday. Okay. <laughs> some of you just trying to get through speech class. <laughs> so, but people, some people, they long to tell, they want those big jobs. But they don't want to clean up the, the mess that all the kids made on the bus or in the classroom. Now that's beneath them. No, all things are important. And pride can play a, a factor in a couple of different ways. So I'll give you a couple of different ways pride can play a factor. So we're talking about number one, pride, but letter A underneath this, people get puffed up. People get puffed up. Sometimes um, God will use us and we'll get all you know, excited about what we just did. <laughs> you know, isn't it amazing? We pray that God will use us and then God does and then, look what I just did. We take all the credit. Now, wait a minute. You're just pray begging God. I can't do this. I need your help. And he hears you. And he says, I know you can't do it. I know you need my help. So I'll give you my help. And then he gives us the help. And then we are able to do it. And then we walk away saying, yeah, did you hear that? Did you, did you see how I told that story? Did you see when I told the, kid that the kids the verse? They were just, no one ever paid attention to the verse like they did when I taught it. Well, you know, I think we can get a little bit puffed up here. The Bible says in Romans 12, 3, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, it is... I know some of you, you're studying for the ministry and to have a, you know, some of you guys, you're here to learn how to be a pastor or a missionary or something. And so, yes, there's some excitement. You want to preach. That's what you're called to do. And so you're looking forward to opportunities. But we got to be careful that uh, we don't get a big head with, uh, with, with this in the process. So people sometimes get puffed up. Letter B would be people get offended. As I kind of mentioned earlier, some people get proud because they're not used as they think they should be. They, and we sometimes can begin to overestimate our abilities. A lot of times we think we're a lot better than we really are. Now I'll take a, something totally different, you know, example of this. You ever see someone walking down the street and they look like an absolute fool? I mean, they, they, their hair is like going in 52 different directions. You know, they, they've got 89 piercings, you know, and most of their skin is tattooed and they get these really weird clothes on and they walk down the, the street and they just got the strut about them and they think they are so cool. And they spent a lot of time in the mirror getting their hair to, to go in all those different directions. And so, and they're doing this, they're in the mirror doing this, thinking, wow, you look good. And really, they don't look good, <laughs> right? They have an, uh, an overestimated opinion of themselves. Now, people do that with how they look. Some of you do that. I, you get there in the mirror, and you're like combing your hair. Oh, some of you should. Um, <laughs> you know, every, every, every hair's gotta be just right, and then the, the girls, You know, and it's, oh yeah, you know, okay. <laughs> and some of you guys, you, you guys will work 15 minutes on the right knot, all right? You know, you tie the tie and put it up there and done with it, amen? Amen. I mean, you take amen. 15 minutes trying, I got the knot, man, it is the knot. Jesus over there bragging about his, his knot. <laughs> You should, but it should have spent 15 more minutes on yours. <laughs> but uh, people, uh, it's easy to overestimate their abilities, too. And how good they are with kids. I'm really good with kids. Really? I, I didn't see that. <laughs> you know, I can tell a story. Great. All right. You going to tell one now? Yeah, I just did. Now, show me the good one. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 8, 2, 
And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. So just the time you think you're starting to know something, you're pretty good. Realize one thing. You don't know anything yet. And I'm saying this is, this is true. The, the, the older I get, the longer I'm in the ministry, the more I realize I am not, I, I don't even know why God uses me. <laughs> what on earth? You get to start seeing yourself for what you really are the closer you get to the Lord and the longer you've been trying to serve him. A.W. Tozer said this, he can do nothing with the man who thinks that he is of use to God. So God can do nothing with a person who thinks that they're of great use to him. Now, we shouldn't be lifted up with pride. We should, there's other people who think they can't even be used to God. No, you should have, if God calls you to do something, you should have faith and the assurance that God will use you. But I'm, I'm, we're talking more from the angle of pride here now. Some may have been, like I said before in the first day of class, maybe the star of the show back home. And that's okay. But uh, it's not okay either because then you'd be tempted to feel sorry for yourself because you're not the star of the show here. Or you're not the star of the show when you go to some other church and serve there. And remember, no one should be trying to be the star of the show. It's not a show. <coughs> it's an opportunity to try to serve God and help people. So remember that you're called to be a servant, not necessarily just to have a position. I've said that many times. I'll probably say it a couple more times. Why? So I'm trying to get this into our heads and into our hearts. You know, in the past, now I've run five different churches in my years of ministry. At one time, I ran three churches at one time. It was normal for me to preach seven or eight times at, at, at one point, seven or eight times a week at one point. Now, I enjoy preaching. Here, I don't preach as much. I preach much less. And I have no problem that I am not the main man anymore. My job is not to be the main man. I'm not the pastor, the pastor, the pastor, the head pastor. I'm not, I am just supposed to be a servant. So if I am just a servant, I should be able to fit in back here at Fairhaven and not have to be the main man and not have to preach all the time and preach all the services. My job is to serve as God sees fit if I'm being the right kind of servant. Joel. Stuff like that in the notes. Like, stories My stories? Ooh, that's I mean, a good question. Stories, that's right. Most people remember the stories more than remember the points anyway, so <laughs> I wouldn't worry about that part. <laughs> so the first, um, yeah, you don't have to write down all, all of my life stories in detail. I give them to try to illustrate a point is why I try to get them. I try, hope, hoping that it'll make the point stick. So pride is one of the pitfalls. Secondly is overzealousness. Some think that they're going to change the world in a day. You think your message, your lesson, your visit, whatever, is going to be the key to someone's problem and it's all going to be fixed because you were there. Some people throw themselves into the ministry and they'll neglect other responsibilities. But we have to maintain a balance, as we mentioned before. So overzealousness is another pitfall. It's not one that most people are guilty of, but it is some that's, that there will be a couple here and there that just, they just want to do everything <laughs> for God and forget. forget. Yeah, you better be careful, too. When you, when you get... Uh, when you get married, you, you go into a ministry somewhere, your first responsibility is not your church. Your first responsibility, obviously, is to God, but after God is your family. Okay? And if you neglect your marriage and you neglect your children because you're out winning souls all the time and you lose your own kids, that's not real wise. Okay? You've got to make sure you're... you're got to balance in doing everything you're supposed to be doing. Number three, would, a third pitfall would be apathy. This would be the, uh, basically the opposite of overzealousness, and we find this probably more frequently. Some workers seem to have absolutely no concern about anything. They don't show an interest in the children. They don't put much effort into their responsibilities. They're 
everything's sloppy. They look sloppy. They talk sloppy. Their hair is sloppy. You know, they, their visuals are sloppy. Their presentation of a story is sloppy. Their verse tokens are sloppy. Everything's just slop, slop, slop. And, and when they do show up, and they are in, in the Sunday school, the junior church, or on the bus, they're clock watchers. What do I mean by that? They're ready to do what? Get out of there. Are we almost done yet? You know, it's like the little kid in the back seat. Are we almost there yet? You know, it gets annoying after a while. You know, the, the kid thinks that parents like to drive for, you know, 10 hours straight. We don't like it either, okay? Are we almost there yet? No! <laughs> but that's the, that's the look that sometimes workers have you know, while they're in the ministry, and while they're sitting on, when they're the bus blob bouncing up and down on the, on the bus in the back seat, you know, jiggle, 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 you know, the bus blob. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then you've got, um, or they're sitting in the back of the, of the Sunday school or the junior church class, they're just, they're ready to get out of there. Just ready to get out of there. It's, it's, the, it's the same look that the, in, as the kids have when, are we almost there yet? Are we almost done yet? Can I get out of here? I want to go home. I'm hungry. I'm hungry too. <laughs> okay. But we're serving God right now. All right. Sometimes we just have to set that ourselves aside. Apathy. What does it say to a child when, when the verse tokens look absolutely horrible? What does it say to a child? It said, whoever made these don't care. That's what it says. So I, I don't know how to make them. Well, if you care, you will learn how to make them. I've, I've, had, I've, had, I've had some that were so, I mean, it's like they didn't even try. It's like, what on earth did you do? You know, you forgot. <laughs> and you slapped something together. And they were so horribly ugly, it was unbelievable. Now, I've used some that weren't great. And not everyone's going to be great. I understand that. But... They were cut out by hand. You could see the jagged. They weren't even straight. They were all crooked. And there's no color. It was white paper. No pic I think one, one time someone wrote out on a piece of paper the verse, and they didn't even have great handwriting. They slapped in the copier, made photocopies, cut them up by hand, and gave me a stack of jagged things. And I looked at them and... And I made some myself. You say... Why? Because I'm not going to go out there as a bus captain and say I don't care. Because I do care just because the worker didn't care. They're not going to give me a bad rep because they didn't care. I care. Okay, so what does it say when you forgot to bring the game? It says the same thing, doesn't it? I don't care. When your visuals just slap together, thrown together. I don't care. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. We shouldn't be apathetic. We need to wake up. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. Wherefore, he saith, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. It's time that, if you're apathetic, wake up, shake up that apathy, and get moving. Okay. Now, a lot of this, you know, how does someone slip into being ap apathetic anyway toward the ministry? You say, that doesn't, I don't even see how they could do that. And others will say, you describe me to a T. Well, why, what is the real problem? The real problem is their heart's not right with God. They're not close with God. They're not walking with God. The other problem might be that we're trying to, walk with God and we got this flesh that just is always against the Lord and it's a real struggle and we have to learn to overcome our flesh and deny ourselves so it's it's a battle sometimes and everybody can face apathy but we have to shake it off and it's a lot easier to do when we're serving the Lord and getting close to him and asking for help number four another pitfall is disorganization Oh, yeah, disorganization. Some people have a tremendous heart for their people. They really do. I mean, they'd give the shirt off their back. But they're so disorganized, 
that they run a completely sloppy ministry. There's pastors like this. I mean, they love people, they love souls, they love this, but everything is just, I mean, they're disheveled. <laughs> the, the, the services are, unor everything's unorganized. They've got a big heart, but no direction. You say, well, that's not my personality. It might not be your personality, but it's still something God wants you to do is to try to be organized. Okay? People can't find things. They always forget to bring things. I remember I was visiting with a bus captain once. Uh, I, was, I was home on furlough, and I was out visiting with a bus captain. <laughs> nice guy, big heart, you know. And I went to one house, and the bus mom says, now, so-and-so forgot their, their, uh, their jacket. Did you, you said you were going to bring it. Oh, forgot to bring it, you know. <laughs> we go to the, another house, and then... You know, he forgot to do something there. Oh, you know, he's just very, he was just very disorganized. Big heart, loves his people, but very disorganized. But that'll, some people, you, you, they can be forgiving if they see, oh yeah, he really did blow it. And, but at the same time, you don't want to be doing that all the time. It doesn't help you and it, and it can hinder your, um, your ministry. Here's something that uh, is very important I've learned. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Very important that we get organized. 1 Corinthians 14, 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Be sure that you, you, that you write things down. Try to write them down in one place and review your notes over and over again so you know what your responsibilities are. Be sure to plan things out in advance. Now, you say, well, it's just me. I'm a little disorganized. You're going to limit what you can do in the future sometime then. Okay? What if you are disorganized? How many have been on a skate day already? Okay, how many have been on a B-Route skate day? All right, and how many are going to be on a, a B-Route skate day where the service won't be here this Sunday? Okay. That, if you're not organized, is a disaster waiting to happen. All right, I remember being <coughs> a bus captain and we would we would have skate day service at the rink. So we'd skate, we'd have, we'd have, we'd, we'd have the service, we'd have skating. A couple different uh, scenarios that we followed. Uh, but I remember one, one time we had skate day, we had 444 people on our, my route. That's not gonna go real well if you don't have it planned. Now I had to schedule not just the skating, that was the easy part. Not really the easy part, because to have 444 skates for every, available for everybody at the same time was another thing. But you don't worry about that right now. What you're worried about is everyone's got to get there on time. So you got all these buses. I think we had five buses at that time, four or five buses. Everyone's got to be there at the right time. Well, you've got to have a place for the little kids, for like a nursery. You've got to have... <laughs> A class for the first and second graders. There's going to be a lot of first and second graders. You have 444 people. There's going to be a lot of first and second graders. How do you know how many to have? Now, you've got one skating rink. You've got one big rink. And that's all you've got. So where are you going to have class for the nursery, for the first and second graders, for the third and fourth graders, for the fifth and sixth graders, and for the teenagers and, the, and above? Where are you going to have class? Well, you've got to figure that out. So, you see, on when such and such bus arrives and such and such bus arrives, we dismiss it. You guys dismiss here, you dis dismiss there. And then we'll use bus 122 for the nursery. We'll use bus such and such for first and second grade. Now you also have to arrange all your bus workers and put them where they best fit. 
you need someone who can lead in each of those classes and then helpers underneath that. Now what happens if you got this all organized and someone doesn't show up on time? Where are you going to have church? Okay, third and fourth graders, you don't have church. Just go play in the parking lot. Now what if someone gets saved or wants to get saved? Probably should have a place to counsel them. Where are you going to counsel them? In the parking lot? So you have another bus. This is what I did. So I had another bus. That's the counseling bus. And then you have to have some decision slips. And you have to have some people available to counsel. And what happens when there's some rowdy kids? You might have to have someone available to, you know, watch and supervise them, too. If someone has to be taken out of class. There's a lot of logistics. You've got to figure out when to feed them, how to feed them, who's going to give out the skates, who's going to be... You have to have everything down. What if you're disorganized? How's that going to go off? Chaos. It's not going to go off. Okay. And the purpose of the day is not so that kids can skate. The purpose of the day is to have what? Church. And to preach. And to present the gospel. And to see people get saved. And you've got to be very organized and you've got to have it all down to a T. If you don't, it's going to be a problem. All right, so that's disorganization. Make sure you learn to get organized. It's a biblical quality, especially when he says, let all things be done decently in order. That's not only to those who are naturally organized. That's a command to everybody. Number five. Here's another pitfall of servants. Criticalness, criticalness, being critical. Some have an eye for finding problems. <coughs> and you can go on the bus, and you can go on the Sunday school, junior church, and you can find problems in every one of them. You can find problems in every class. You can, pro you can find a problem in every sermon. You can find a problem with my class. You can find a problem with everything. That's why you're so happy all the time, because all you do is find problems with everybody. And some people are great at nitpicking. You guys know what nitpicking is? You know what nitpicking is, Nathan? You do? Literally, do you know what nitpicking is? Yes. It's picking those nits. Girls, lice? Those little eggs are called the nits, and you have to pick them out one at a time, strand by strand. Oh, yeah, you start itching them. <laughs> and if you don't get them all out, they hatch and you get lice again. Oh, ha, 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 ha. But it's just, it's a very tedious thing. It's just, just picking, picking, picking. Some people are just that way. They're always picking and finding problems with other people. Romans 14, 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? He shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. Rather than being critical, and it's easy to do, maybe we could be helpful and lend a helping hand. If someone's struggling with something, uh, help him out with it. Number six, another pitfall for servants is backsliding. The devil wants to render every one of us useless. And if he can get you to be backslidden, you will have no heart for God and you'll have no heart for the people that he wants you to minister to. You'll show up for your ministry, you'll put in your time, you do your duty, and you're done. It's an empty feeling. You've got no heart for it. And the Bible tells us, and of course in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 13, gives us the... Um, the armor that we can put on so that we can we can stand against that number seven short-sightedness short-sightedness that's the idea of not having not being able to see afar off okay if someone's nearsighted they can see things up close they can't see things at a distance okay and so the idea of being short-sighted spiritually is 
All we can see is what's right in front of us, and we cannot see any further down the road. And we've got to learn to be able to make goals in our ministries, make goals for yourself to, to become better at different things, make goals for other people. Now, that's a little harder. You can make goals for people. You're not always going to um, reach them because, obviously, they're involved. <laughs> but you can at least set some goals. I'd like to see this person you know, come into church more faithfully. I'd like to uh, help this bad kid. And the, you will have some bad kids in the class. And you can, you can try to fight fire with fire and it doesn't necessarily work. Okay, some kid comes in and he's got an attitude and he's not going to do anything. And then what does he get you to do? He gets you all worked up and then you got an attitude and then you, I told you to sit down. Now if you don't sit down, you're doing just what he wants you to do. He got you. That's what he wanted. He wanted to get under your skin and it worked. And of course, he's going to settle down once you do that, right? No. You know, you, you, you lost, okay? You lost. So have some goals. That really, really cantankerous bad kid, when he comes in and before he shows the first sign of being cantankerous, or maybe he's shown the first sign, but he has not really crossed the line yet, you go and try to be a little proactive and say, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down. And I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk to him. I'm going to say hi. I'm going to say, hey, how's it going? You know, sometimes I'll, I, I do um, go in and preach for Mr. Reinhardt in his fifth and sixth grade junior church. And there are some of those kids that are just, whew, I'm telling you, they're not always cooperative. And you can see some of them right off. And it's, it's, e it's easy. If you can get to some of them early enough, you, in a sense, you earn their respect. You, you know, there's a, I know this, this kid's going to be a problem, but before he is a big problem, hey, how you doing? It's good to see you today. Yeah, things going all right? It's going to be harder for him to be a real jerk to you because you were just nice to him. Now, he might still be a jerk to you because, you know, jerks are still going to be jerks, right? <laughs> but the, pro the point is you, you, can, you, you can offset some of that. Have some goals. Determine to set a goal to really make an impact in someone's life. I would challenge you that even, even in, you pick one of your ministries or each one of the ministries that you're in, whatever it is, and say, I am gonna pray and ask God to, to point someone out to me that I can pray over, especially, we should be praying for everybody, I understand that, but especially to pray over and to work with and, I'm, and to have a goal to make a real impact in their life. And you'll see, God will, <coughs> lead you to someone and he'll give you someone to work with and he'll give you some help and, and you can start seeing some things. So don't be short-sighted just seeing everything at face value, just seeing what's, what's there for you that day and that's it. Number eight, another pitfall is laziness. Laziness. Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat do you know lazy people they want blessings too they want the fruit of hard work they, they want all of that they just don't want to do the hard work that gets the fruit you know lazy people they want things but they don't get them hard workers get them but even lazy people want things you might not think you're lazy. You might not think you are. You might really say, well, I want to have a good ministry. I want to help these kids. I want to keep my temper. I want to make a difference. I want to make an impact. I want good visuals. I want to make nice verse tokens. Oh, I'm just using these examples. I want to do all of these things, but that doesn't get them. Right? What gets them? Hard work hard work. I wish I had, well it doesn't matter what you wish you have. So even lazy people have <coughs> desires. They want good things. But what makes them lazy is that they don't get them. 
So if you're, you are an underachiever, <laughs> you're never reaching what you want to get. You know, it just could be you're lazy. And don't convince yourself that you're not because you want them. That's not the same as doing something about it and getting them. Okay? We've got to learn to work and pray. Someone once said, you know, you work like everything depends on you and you pray like everything depends on God. That's a pretty good, uh, pretty good thing to live by. And God will bless us because faith without works is dead, isn't it? It's dead. You can have faith, but faith without doing something about it is really not faith because you didn't have faith that God's going to do something. So, but when you have faith, you trust God's going to help. God's going to bless. God's going to work. You'll do something. Number nine. This one probably applies to nobody in here. Not true. <laughs> Discouragement. Discouragement. Some of you are discouraged right now. Discouragement. Numbers chapter 21. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. We'll, we'll spend a couple minutes here. Why, why not? I'm the teacher. We can get a little diverted, can't we? Numbers 21. We're actually, we're doing fine with time in our notes, so I want to take a couple minutes here and try to help. Discouragement. It's very easy to get discouraged in the ministry. Some of you are discouraged right now. Some of you are like, I want to go home. It's been... And what, we've been here three weeks or something like that? Three or four weeks? I'm ready to go home. Especially some of the young ladies, and I'm not making fun of you. I'm not, I'm just, I understand. It's, I want to go home. I want to go home. I'm discouraged. I failed my first quiz. <laughs> yeah, just wait till next Friday. You'll fail enough. No, I'm, just, I'm teasing. <laughs> Brother Olson, I thought you were trying to encourage me. <laughs> Numbers 21. Um, in verse number 4, the Bible says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was, what? Much discouraged because of what? Because of the way. The way. The way was the road. The path that they were on discouraged them. Listen, let me just say, if God has called you to come to college, he chose that path, and it's not always going to be easy. Hiking is not always easy. Taking a long journey is not always easy. It can be strenuous. It can be tiring. It can be difficult. And we have to be very careful that we don't get discouraged because of it. They were discouraged because of the way they were journeying. There ever been times where you just want to sit and do nothing? But you know you don't have time to do that? And some of you do it anyway. <laughs> and that's why you probably failed your quiz. Anyway. <laughs> Jeez. The soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Sometimes in the ministry, the way is not easy. And if we can't make it through a semester of Bible college, how are we going to make it through in life? Okay. If, you have, if you're entertaining any thoughts of, I want to quit, <coughs> get them out of your head right now. Because you're going to quit the rest of your life. We don't quit when we come up across difficulty. We don't quit because things are tough. We keep going. And we keep going by faith because who led them on this way? God led them on this way. Who was with them on the way? It was God who was with them on the way. God chose the path. He was with them. God chose a path for you. He's with you. When you get in the ministry, you know, you're going to say, I didn't expect this. It's okay. 
God expected he knew it was coming. What are you going to do? Quit? You can, but it's not going to be very good. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help the people that God wanted you to help. We just keep going on. And we can, if we're not careful, we can end up like the children of Israel. They were much discouraged because of the way. I got a question. Why were they so busy looking at the way? What should they have been looking at? Maybe God? Maybe at the... Where they were heading? Were they marching to victory? They were. But they were so, oh. See, God wants to give us victory. God wants to bring us into the land of blessings. God has so much for us. And yet they were so busy looking at the problems that they couldn't see what was coming. Just thought of this in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says in verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher for our faith, who for the joy that was set, to, set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus had to go to the cross. He chose to go to the cross. And how did he endure it? How did he get through it? The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him endured. He wasn't looking at all the pain and suffering he was enduring. He was looking further down the road. He was looking down the road to uh, rising again from the dead. He was looking forward to the people who were going to be able to call on his name and be saved. He was looking forward to being reunited with the Father in heaven. He, he had a lot to look forward to. And he didn't get sidetracked by looking at the problems. And so the cross was difficult but he wasn't going to be discouraged by it. And Satan is always going to do what he can to show us that it's no use. It just doesn't work. Things just don't get any better. It's just going to get harder. And it's just going to get colder. <laughs> right, James? Right. Just going to get colder and colder. That's okay, but... For the joy that was set before him, he goes back to Zambia. And you can cook for the rest of your life. Amen? You see? Just a few short years is worth it. So God's there. He's going to help us. And the devil's going to say it's no use. But he's a liar. He's always lied. And we need to do what David did. And in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse number 6, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You get discouraged, it's time to get encouraged. And the only way you're going to get encouraged is to get to the Lord. And a lot of times the reason why we get discouraged is because we didn't do what God told us to do in the first place. We get discouraged because we didn't study like we were supposed to. Because we wasted time. Because we were lazy. We get discouraged on the bus route because we didn't prepare like we were supposed to. Oh, it's, it's not God's fault we're discouraged. Most of the failures go right back on us. And sometimes we just get discouraged with ourselves. You ever get that way? Man, I'm so sick of me. That's good because everyone else is sick of you too. <laughs> but it's actually pretty good sometimes when we realize that we are sick of ourselves so that we can come back to the Lord and say, Lord, I need help. And it's a good place to be, is be humbled so that God can bless us. Number 10, weariness. Weariness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Now, you get tired sometimes. You get tired. But don't. Get tired of doing what's right. Don't get tired of following God. There's just some things you can't get tired of doing. I had a roommate in college. His name was Frank. And uh, he brought a tire into the room. 
I said, Frank, what are you doing with that tire? You know, <laughs> I was the room captain. I wanted the room, look, and, and I had Frank. If you, if you knew Frank, that was tough. Big heart, nice guy, but he was Frank. And so Frank, he's got this tire. He says, what are you doing with the tire? He says, oh, this is Mr. Tire. So he gets a hat. He puts the hat on t Mr. Tire. He puts a tie on Mr. Tire. And he says, this is Mr. Tire. And this is his object lesson. He was going to tell in his junior church. He says, kids, and he's giving me the rundown. Don't get tired of coming to church. <laughs> okay? Don't get tired of the Bible. All right? And so this is Frank. And, and he pulled it off, okay? And I was like, Frank, we can't have that in the room. So the dorm supervisor came through. And he was check. What's this tire? Get rid of this. You know, and, and so Frank hid the tire somewhere else in the room. And I, I, I don't remember. There was, there was some funny stuff that went on with Frank sometimes. But don't get tired of doing what's right. You'll remember this because, uh, because of Mr. Tire. And I didn't even have Mr. Tire. I should bring Mr. Tire for you someday. But it, it, it was very effective. Don't be weary in well-doing. In Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we... What? Faint not. Fainting has the idea of quitting. You're going to be tired, but don't get so tired that you quit. <coughs> don't get tired of doing what's right. Be not weary in well-doing. In due season. The idea, again, is we're looking past our present situation. We're not going to be discouraged. We're not going to get too weary, although our body does get weary. And make sure you get some rest, too. All right. I'm not giving you permission to sleep in past wake up time but get some rest take care of your body and uh, you'll you'll do all right but spiritually don't get tired don't get tired and if you're tired of doing what's right you've got a spiritual problem <coughs> it's, it goes further than a physical problem it's a spiritual problem it's time to take some time with the Lord extra time and if you have I hope you all have your devotions if you don't you're gonna struggle but I'm telling you one thing, your devotions is not going to be enough. There are going to be times where you're going to need to have extra time with God just to get alone, just to get your re batteries recharged and stay focused on what the Lord wants you to do. And if you struggle with just having your personal daily devotions, it's, it's, not, it's not going to go well for you. You're going to have to take some extra time. And then God will give you the strength. And if God calls you to do something... Whether it's in your ministries here, whether it's, through, you know, whether it's for your schooling, whether it's for a future ministry, as a school teacher, on the mission field, as a pastor, whatever it is, if God calls you to do something, he'll enable you to do it. Okay? So you can get it done. And that's when you have to remind yourself that. Sit back and say, okay, Lord, confess your sin of worry, fear, laziness, whatever it is, and say, Lord, I need help. Get focused. And then get your batteries charged. Batteries charged. Batteries charged. Batteries charged. Batteries charged.